I ventured to propose a prescription, but Napoleon grew impatient and manifested the greatest aversion to every kind of medicine at 7 p.m. He was in bed. He had dined at 6, but his stomach rejected the food he had eaten almost immediately after. 28th, extreme prostration of strength, eyes livid and nearly extinct, dry and nervous cough, mouth parched, distressing thirst, painful sensation of the stomach. 29th, same state, deep melancholy. 30th, the emperor's health was in a deplorable state, but his sufferings only tended to increase his aversion to all medicines. I endeavored in vain to combat and overcome his repugnance. He resisted, promised, eluded, and at the very moment when I thought I had obtained what I wished, I found that I had not gained anything. I was overwhelmed with the spectacle of this great man consuming before my eyes. Grief at seeing the remedy at hand and not being able to apply it. Affection, regret, all these sentiments agitated my mind. My strength was exhausted. Napoleon perceived it and said to me, you are not well. You are suffering. You are sinking under some disease. Are you also doomed to fall a victim to this horrible climate? Courage. I will send for a physician from Europe to assist you. I was so overjoyed at this resolution that I did not allow myself sufficient leisure to weigh my answer. Ah, sire, replied I with emotion. Make haste then, whilst it is yet time. Whilst it is yet time? What do you mean? Is it you that are to die before he arrives or I? If such is my fate, be it so. But in no case will I consult or see the English physicians who are in the island. I would rather suffer than see them round me. Besides, of what use could they be to me? I have placed my confidence in you. You take an interest in me. I judge of your attachment by your zeal. And I'm grateful for the care you take of me. But dear doctor, if my hour has come, if it is written above that I am to die, neither you nor all the physicians in the world can alter the decree. In saying these words, his eyes were raised towards heaven, and the sound of his voice was elevated and sonorous. I could not master my emotion and withdrew. I had a violent fever and was for several days unable to attend him. At last, as he wished to see me, I made an effort and went to him. I found him in bed complaining of an intolerable pain proceeding from the left hypochondriac region and extending on one side up to the corresponding shoulder and on the other to the lumbar region. He experienced great difficulty in breathing and the abdomen was considerably distended, ordered fomentations and an anodyne draft. The latter produced frequent and insipid rotations. February 11th, the emperor had passed a good night and at six in the morning took a rice suit the symptoms of the preceding day appeared again and were again removed by the same means. In the afternoon, I prescribed a bitter mixture. 12. Napoleon a little better this morning. He, however, rejected at 10 o'clock the little food he had taken. He would hear no more of the bitter mixture. 13. The emperor took a little cream and jelly. The vomiting ceased. Spirits gloomy. 14. The illustrious patient was better than on the preceding day and ate with tolerable appetite. His spirits were also considerably better. 15. Continued amendment. Were you Milan, doctor, said he, when I went to take the iron crown? No, sire. And when I went to Venice, I was not there either. But your majesty had just planted our eagles on the banks of the Vistula. Italy was intoxicated with glory. Its whole population eagerly flocked around you. It is true, and I was enthusiastically received, particularly in the Lagunis. Venice had put all her gondolas out to sea. Nothing was seen on all sides, but fringes, feathers, silks, all that was handsome and elegant had assembled from all parts of the Fazine, and never had the Adriatic witness so pompous a spectacle. That explosion of feeling was not to be wondered at, for with one hand, you were driving the Sarmatians from a land which they had polluted, and with the other, you were erecting monuments, making roads, and constructing or creating everywhere the most beautiful establishments. Besides, the march of your administration was so firm and so rapid. You were right. It was an immense machine, the wheels of which were perfectly well adapted. I exposed their action and its cause to the legislative body and produced a great effect. Italy approved of the principles I developed. 
I felt anxious to know what were the principles to which the emperor was alluding and having looked for and found the speech he pronounced on the occasion referred to, I read it. Gentlemen of the legislative body, said he, I have taken a minute review of all the different branches of administration and have introduced into them the same simplicity which, with the help of advice and censure, I have applied to the revision of the Constitution of Lyon. Whatever is good and grand is always the result of a system of simplicity and uniformity. I have suppressed the double organization of the departmental and prefectural administrations because I have thought that by entrusting the administrative duties to the prefects alone, not only a saving of one million would be affected in the expenses, but a greater rapidity would be obtained in the march of affairs if I have placed near the prefects a council for the decision of litigious transactions. It is in conformity with the principle that administration should be the act of one man and the decision of litigation is the act of many. The statutes which have just been read to you extend to my people of Italy the advantages of the operation of the code over the framing of which I myself presided. I have directed my counsel to prepare an organization of the judicial department that may give to the tribunals the importance and consideration I intend they shall possess. I could not approve that a praetor alone should have the power of pronouncing upon the fortunes of the community, and that judges, concealed from the public view, should secretly decide not only upon their interests, but upon their lives. In the organization which will be presented to you, my counsel will endeavor to bestow upon my people all the advantage resulting from collective tribunals, public proceedings, and the public defense of both parties. It is in order to secure to them an administration of justice more evidently enlightened than I have decided that the judges who pronounce judgment shall be those who have also presided at the debates. I have not thought that the circumstances in which Italy is placed could allow me to think of the establishment of juries, but the judges are to pronounce as juries would upon their own conviction without adopting that system of semi-evidence which tends more frequently to endanger innocence than to lead to the discovery of the guilty. The surest rule to guide the judge who has presided at a trial is the conviction of his own conscience. I have superintended in person the establishment of regular and secure forms in the finances of the state, and I hope my people will feel the advantage of the order, which I have directed my Minister of Finances and of the Public Treasure to introduce into the accounts which will be published. I have consented that the public debt should bear the name of Mont Napoleon in order to give an additional security to its engagements and a renewed vigor to credit. Public instruction will cease to be departmental. I have fixed certain bases in order to give it the unity, uniformity, and direction which must exercise so great an influence over the manners and habits of a rising generation. I have thought it advisable to begin from this year to introduce a greater degree of equality in the repartition of departmental expenditure and to assist those in my department, such as departments of Mincio and Lower Po, who are suffering from the necessity of defending themselves against the devastations caused by the waters. The finances are in the most prosperous condition, and no arrears exist in any of the payments of the state. My people of Italy pay less taxes than any other, and they will not be called upon to bear any additional burden in that respect. And if alterations have been effected in some of the contributions, if a duty for the registry of acts has been introduced in the project of the budget, Upon a moderate scale, it is in order to be able to diminish taxes of a more onerous nature. The cadastra is full of imperfections which become apparent every day. I shall endeavor to remedy those defects and to overcome the obstacles opposed to such operations, much less by the nature of things than by private interests. I do not, however, flatter myself to obtain such results as will obviate the necessity of allowing a tax to reach its full amount. I have adopted measures for bestowing on the clergy a suitable endowment of which they have been in part deprived for the last 10 years, 
And my object in restoring some confidence, as I have done, has been to protect those who devote themselves to service of public utility or who placed in the interior of the country amongst the peasantry find themselves in a situation and in circumstances to supply the place of regular clergy. I have also made such provision as will enable the bishops to be useful to the poor, and I only wait to take into consideration the condition of the curates until I have received the information resulting from the inquiries I have directed to be immediately made respect in their true situation. I know that many of them, particularly those living in the mountains, are in a state of poverty, which I have the most anxious wish to relieve. In addition to the road to the Simplon, which will be completed this year and on which 4,000 workmen are at this moment employed for that part only, which crosses the kingdom of Italy. I have ordered that the port of Villano should be begun and that these important labors should be commenced without delay and carried on with activity. I have not neglected any of the objects respecting which my experience in matters of administration could be useful to my people. And before I repass the mountains, I shall visit some of the departments in order to be better acquainted with their wants. I shall leave as depository of my authority a young prince whom I have brought up from his childhood and who will therefore be animated with the same spirit as myself. But I have at the same time made such arrangements as will bring the most important affairs of the state under my immediate direction. The orators of my council will present to you the project of a law for granting to the Melzi, my chancellor and keeper of the seals, and during four years, the depositary of my authority as vice president, a domain which may remain in his family as a testimony to his descendants of the satisfaction I have derived from his services. I think I have furnished additional proofs of my undeviating resolution to do for my people of Italy all they expect of me. I hope they will in their turn occupy that place in my estimation which I have intended for them. They can only do this by being thoroughly persuaded that the army is the principal prop of a state. It is time that those young men who lead the idle life of cities should cease to dread the fatigues and dangers of war and should place themselves in a situation to be able to cause their country to be respected if they wish it to be respectable. Gentlemen of the legislative body, emulate by your zeal my council of state and by your joint cooperation towards the attainment of public prosperity. Afford to my representative that support which he must derive from you. The British government having given an evasive answer to the proposals I had made to them and the King of England having immediately made those proposals publicly known and insulted my people in his parliament. The hopes I had entertained of the reestablishment of peace have considerably diminished. The French fleets have, however, since then, obtained advantages to which I only attach some importance because they must serve to convince my enemies of the in utility of war in which they can gain nothing and may lose everything the divisions of the flotilla the frigates built at the expense of the finances of my kingdom of Italy and which now form part of the French forces have on several occasions rendered beneficial services I still hope that the peace of the continent will not be disturbed though my position does not allow me to dread any of the chances of war. I shall be in the midst of you whenever my presence is necessary to the safety of my kingdom of Italy.